Great. I think uh, I'm just asking. Hi, all. A very warm welcome to all of you at the ninth Tech Talks of Plaksha University. I am Ritesh Malik. I'm the founder of Innovate Coworking and one of the founding members of Plaksha University. Plaksha is a collective initiative of 80 plus technology leaders, entrepreneurs, and, and, and academicians to set up a university to reimagine technology education in India. Our mission is to empower students with cutting edge technologies to solve grand challenges of the world. The Plaksha campus would be a 50 acre state of the art facility opening next year, 2021 in Chandigarh. Our maiden on-campus batch next year will offer exciting majors such as computer sciences, artificial intelligence, robotics, cyber physical systems, biological systems engineering, as well as data science and business and economics. Laksha Tech Talks is a mission to get eminent speakers and industry experts of the world who are at the forefront of leveraging technology innovations to solve grand challenges of the world. Today, we have one such speaker, a veteran in healthcare research and technology, Sanjay Joshi. Sanjay, thank you very much for your time and a very warm welcome to you at Plaksha. Hi, Rajesh. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing very well, Sanjay. Thank you very much for your time this early in the morning. Wishing you a very happy Teacher's Day and we are all looking forward to getting in, in, enlightened from you. I'm a more an engineer than a teacher. I kind of wandered into biology, but uh, <laughs> we'll see how good a teacher I am after this. <laughs> Thank you. So I'll, I'll just give you a very brief background on Sanjay. He's the current CTO at the healthcare division at Dell. He's a veteran when it comes to translational genomics, data storage, infrastructure, electronic medical records, lab information management systems, precision med medicine, bioengineering, revenue cycle management for healthcare organizations and whatnot has a career spanning over 21 years, and he's been conferred multiple awards and recognitions, one of which is the prestigious National Institute of Health Small Business Innovation and Research Award for his work by the government of India. He holds a master's degree in biomedical engineering from University of New South Wales in Sydney, and he's done his, his undergrad from Bangalore or in India and has further studied at the University of Washington in molecular biology. He has contributed a lot to the health tech space globally. And as a medical doctor, I'm extremely psyched for the next one hour to be learning from Sanjit. Thank you very much, Sanjit, for your time. Over to you. Thank you, Ritesh. You're the real doctor here. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you, many of you know that Ritesh is a physician by training. Um, okay. I'm a med school dropout, so uh, <laughs> uh, thank you again. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'll start sharing my screen now. Um, I'm assuming you can see that, Ritesh? Yes, this is good. Thank you. Okay, let's, uh, let's start off uh, uh, about 7 billion years ago. Um, so I'm, I'm sure most of you heard uh, in the press about three days ago um, that scientists detected what's called a gravitational wave um, from uh, the collision or the merger of two massive black holes that happened about... Uh, 17 million uh, light years away, a billion light years away, sorry. Um, and about 7 billion years ago, we just got that signal uh, two, three days ago on Earth. Um, theoretically, the Earth is about 13.8 billion years old, uh, if you believe in stuff like that. Uh, and and uh, there's another theory that it was Brahma's breath and every breath of Brahma was uh, 100,000 years or something like that. Um, in 2014, um, there was another very interesting study. Uh, that's the top left of your screen, uh, which is the twist or the shift to the light um, uh, from the Big Bang, which was the origin of the universe, uh, measured by what's called a Doppler shift. Uh, when you see, when you hear sirens, um, you know uh, the pitch changes as the as the ambulance comes comes closer and kind of fades away as it moves away. So it's the same thing, but this is with light. Um, and so red, you can all the red splotches on the, on the screen um, are what's called the red shift, and that is showing that the universe is expanding. So the outer space is on your top left. On the bottom right of your screen, you actually see what, is, what I term as the inner space, 
which is what stuff, fantastic stuff inside your body. And similarly, you can see these blotches of color um, and kind of fuzzy pictures of every chromosome uh, in a cell. So from your biology class, I'm sure you remember that uh, we have 22 chromosomes and uh, one sex chromosome, which is either X or Y chromosome. Um, this uh, chart is actually from the male fibroblast. Uh, the fibroblast is, uh, is uh, the early part of the cell matrix that creates your uh, tissues and uh, the framework for um, things like collagen and, um, and um, uh, other tissues that, that form um, some of the infrastructure of the human body. Um, the other interesting thing about the Y chromosome is um, it is the smallest chromosome in the human body. Uh, us males are shrimps, as they call them. Um, the female chromosome, on the other hand, is uh, 30 times larger. The female chromosome is 2,100 genes. It's the second largest chromosome in the human body. Uh, women give birth, enough said. So uh, we males are just here to ride along. Uh, there's a fantastic theory that... Um, the male chromosome has been shrinking for the last 40,000 years. And uh, in about a million and a half, two million years, there won't be any males left on, on Earth. Uh, we'll just be uh, probably doing um, some of the things that insects do. You know, we'll be working for women. Uh, and that having been said, <laughs> so how did life start? Um, you know, I'm of the theory, uh, along with some other folks, uh, that life started actually from outside Earth. Uh, that the first elements um, came from stardust, and we are all stardust. Uh, we're water and stardust, basically. Uh, water is a very interesting um, uh, uh, chemical. I'm not going to talk about water today, but uh, it is a very, very interesting and important uh, thing for life. So imagine that um, the first particles of life uh, hitched a ride on a uh, meteorite the size of a basketball. It has to be a certain size. Otherwise, uh, it cannot penetrate the Earth's atmosphere. Um, uh, it'll burn up, basically, if it's too big. Um, so there was a theory that the particles, the first particles of life actually came on a meteorite right at the backside of the meteorite. So, you know, when it enters Earth, the front part gets very hot and becomes glass, actually, uh, at some point. Uh, uh, again, because uh, uh, silicone was uh, uh, one of the things that was there. And then the metals. Um, why, why is um, every planet uh, either nickel or iron in the middle, uh, the core? Uh, there's a great book, if you have some time, go read uh, the book called The Disappearing Spoon. That'll tell you all about you know, chemicals and why some things are, are stable and some are not and so forth. Um, so I actually believe in the thesis that RNA and lipids formed life. And if you see some of the earliest creatures, some of the earliest cell types, viruses included, they have RNA in the middle, and the lipid layer is the, uh, is the surrounding tissue. Um, the, the, the first world in the RNA world was uh, both the form and the function. So it was actually both the source code and the executable for your computer science people or people who are interested in computer science. Um, the data, it, they here. I mean, we're talk, talking about big, big data biology here. So, data, it's it's the it, the data is the RNA itself, um, and and the the uh, this is the code that actually created life. Um, we're read by a decoder, uh, which was actually a protein machine that was ha had to be created. So, when somebody asks you the question, "What came first, chicken or egg?" I would answer egg because the you have to have the machinery to build the chicken. Um, and um, so the protein machine to build proteins was actually built first. So the machine to build the machine was built first. And then um, you, th these were the building blocks for um, uh, complex proteins that make us um, uh, tick every day as humans. Uh, so the coronavirus is actually a very good example of self-replicating RNA, which is shown in the chart here. Um, these, are, um, these are things that uh, actually perpetu perpetuate themselves. So viruses are very interesting creatures. They live between this karmic world between life and not life. Uh, they're actually particles. They're called particles, and that's why they actually hitched a ride uh, across the universe. Uh, there was a study by some Japanese scientists that bacteria actually survive outside in, this, in space as well, in deep space. So there's a whole other theory about uh, um, panspermia and what happens outside Earth. Um, so every day... Um, uh, this is a very, very interesting thesis. Every day, uh, 800 million viruses are deposited uh, in every square meter on Earth. 
Um, and they're carried around in the atmosphere. So there's another whole theory as to where uh, some of our viruses come from. They, some of these viruses actually ride the jet stream on Earth as well. Uh, there's a fantastic experiment done uh, in Colorado where they put a bucket of water in the mountains in Colorado and uh, in the U.S. and collected all the particles that fell into this bucket of water. And there were literally thousands of species of viruses that were not there the day before. It was sterile water the day before. Um, so that's a very interesting thesis as to, you know, who came here first. You know, we came, uh, if, you, if you take um, Earth as uh, one year, um, we are just uh, one less than a second old on Earth. So we are very recent uh, entrance to, to life on Earth. Um, RNA, as you probably, again, remember from your biology class, is the four letters, um, uh, A, G, T, and U. They're called the purines and the pyrimidines. Uh, they are the first molecules uh, that build life. Um, they're, the DNA, on the other hand, is the one letter. Uh, the uracil is replaced uh, um, uh, by, the, uh, uh, by the letter C, the cytosine. So, um, again, I'm not going to go into deep biology here, but the context here is what is the information uh, theory that came first. Um, and uh, so we moved from these complex molecules uh, to some catalysts that had to be some rare earth metals, uh, molybdenum and uh, boron. Um, molybdenum and boron actually don't exist normally. Um, they have to be formed as molybdate and borate, uh, usually with lead or magnesium. So why are um, uh, some metals, magnesium and uh, potassium, why are these important to humans? Uh, which is probably why, <laughs> uh, because we had to have that very early on, sulfur and phosphorus, uh, disulfide bridges in DNA are critical things for uh, replication and things like that. So uh, rare earth metals are actually very important to human beings. Um, Moving on, so uh, if, you, if you see this as kind of this story of life, if you will, um, the first hit, uh, this theory that the meteor came with some particles of life, happened about four and a half billion years ago. And you had to have had certain uh, elements to, uh, to cook life up. So tar, which is basically hydrocarbons, uh, water, I meant, already mentioned water was very important. Portability, which is nobody thinks about, you know, how do things move around in this massive space, which is Earth? It was very hot and very high pressure, a lot of sulfur flowing around. Um, life actually began theoretically in the bottom of the first, um, you know, liquid uh, forms, if you will. And the first uh, creatures were actually bacteria. They were not viruses uh, because viruses don't reproduce themselves technically. Um, uh, not as early creatures, but the virions, but as, as units of life, uh, you had to have had DNA to reproduce. Um, 80, 90 percent of viruses are RNA viruses, so, including SARS-CoV-2, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So initially, um, you know, this primordial soup of tar and water and specialized elements, uh, rare earth elements, um, they actually... Um, uh, were in this lab, the early lab, if you will. Um, and uh, there were hundreds and thousands of combinatorial experiments. And um, not unlike, uh, you know, Monte Carlo, uh, people who um, actually do things in physics and, and mechanical engineering, they simulate these processes uh, using some very elegant mathematical techniques. Or uh, Runge Kutta, uh, actually an Indian guy. Um, and so the first creatures had to be archaic bacteria. And about two billion years ago, uh, uh, more of this writing process happened. Um, and I'll explain why the, the word write is important here. So nothing was there before. Something was written afresh, um, just like uh, Ganesha writing <laughs> um, the thesis, if you will, using his tusk. You know, it was created from nothing. And um, so... Two billion years ago, the first cells without nuclei are prokaryotes. Uh, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but uh, prokaryotes came about um, three and a half billion years ago. And from the prokaryotes to the eukaryotes, eukaryotes are, are cells with nuclei. So the, 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 the machinery to build um, the proteins or the things that make life are actually inside a nucleus. Uh, so eukaryotes actually came about 2 billion years ago. So between the prokaryotes and the eukaryotes, there were not too many right events. 
Um, so there was about 100. Some people say there was 1,000. Um, these are n creation of new things um, within the cellular mechanisms. Everything after eukaryotes came, so the red dots here are uh, non-redundant part of the genome. In other words, these are essential things. Uh, and I'll tell you what essential is and when I talk about trilobites. Uh, trilobites were these creatures that were there millions of years ago, 100 million years ago, more than that, some of them. Um, they're actually horseshoe crabs today. They're actually, uh, horseshoe crabs are very interesting creatures. Um, they have not changed much for millions of years. Um, but the point I want to make here is uh, the r functional non-redundant part of the genome, the essential pieces that make humans and other creatures, um, they have not changed for millions of years. So in the trilobite, um, the, the axial symmetry of the human, you know, the spinal cord, two kidneys, uh, two lungs, um, that axial symmetry actually came from some genes that are hundreds of millions of years old. Um, they're actually called homeobox genes and parallax genes, um, and hox and pax genes. They have not changed. So they, were, they are kind of the essential pieces that make our infrastructure, our skeleton and so forth. Um, but after the early worms, for example, in about a billion years ago, um, you can see the, the top right part of the screen, then the total genome in some higher order species like humans, they, you know, they started diverging from the essential part of the genome. So technically only 1.5% of the human genome uh, actually creates um, uh, organs and proteins and other things. The other 98.5% was called junk, uh, but we're learning that it's actually extremely important for things like um, uh, uh, the folding part. So the human genome is not just a linear piece. It's, it actually folds into this beautiful three-dimensional structure that, that folds and unfolds literally in femtosecond space. So there's a lot of stiff stuff going on in very, very, very fast time inside the human body, but we're this complex mixture that, that can do yoga and, and be self-aware and do other things that, that not other creatures are, uh, can do. So if you kind of take that journey and ask the question, you know, who are we? Um, there's a lot of unrest in the world going on today, and the viruses are winning right now. But, you know, if you ask the basic question, who are we as humans? Um, you know, we have been traveling the earth um, for a long, long time. I mean, traveling as in traveling, wandering around the earth for a long, long time. This chart is actually from Spencer Wells. Spencer uh, was uh, a, uh, a geneticist at Harvard University. He then went to National Geographic and formed the Genographic Project. Um, the two colors in this chart you see, the yellow and the, some of the dark blue or the, uh, the gray, um, so the yellow part is actually uh, the mitochondrial DNA or the maternal side of uh, your ancestry. And the dark gray or the blue part is the paternal part. So the mitochondrial DNA, remember mitochondria from your biology class is the energy powerhouse of the cell. There's between two and six mitochondria in each cell. Mitochondria has been proven now that we actually imbibe bacteria in our system. Mitochondrial DNA is circular. You know, nuclear DNA is linear uh, from a data perspective. Um, and that's actually important if you're a computer scientist. You know, why is it, is it a circular hash? It's actually very efficient. Uh, it can do only one or two things really well. And energy transfer is one of them. So every cell has two or two, six mitochondria. Um, we have 30 to 60 trillion, uh, 30, 30, around 30 trillion cells. Um, and you can see that it is a very distributed mechanism of producing energy. And by the way, that came from our mothers. So that's actually the maternal part of the DNA. Y chromosome, on the other hand, the little shrimp, remember, the 70 genes as compared to the 2,100 genes in the, in the female chromosome, um, they actually are the paternal part. Um, they come from what's called y, uh, y chromosome short tandem repeats. There's small letters that repeat around the Y chromosome. You can actually defer ancestry based on that. So this chart shows you that we have been wandering Earth, uh, the physical part of Earth, for a long time. Um, as long as maybe 180,000 years ago, maybe even as old as 40, 400,000 years ago. So this whole thing about race and ethnicity, you know, we've always been a very, very small place. We've always had mixed. We've always had cultures and ethnicities and even 
interhuman species have bred together and created more more things. And so I kind of smile to myself when I look at all these you know racial inequalities. And I'll, I'll get off my soapbox, but I'm trying to say is uh, we've always been a small planet. We've always been a small species. Um, you know, all the differences are very, very, very small. Um, so you could go all the way back to Neanderthals, which, uh, you know, technically are uh, the earliest human species, the, 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 the ones with brains and uh, tools and decision making and so on, music and language and things like that. Uh, they were actually short, though, so they're technically they're Neander shorts, not Neanderthals. But uh, after that were the early humans in Sima and Altai in southern Spain. And, um, you know, when you say Caucasians, they're actually Central Asians. You know, most modern humans are Central Asians uh, in, from Uzbekistan or Kazakhstan or somewhere else. And then the migration into Africa and out actually happened much more recently. So we have been wanderers for a long time. We followed the coastal migrations, the, the technically the Dravidians, which are uh, um, Indo-Aryans uh, or Iranians, actually. Um, they wandered from Central Asia. You can see this part here into southern um, into southern um, India, um, uh, you know, Kerala and Tamil Nadu and Karnataka and so forth. And then they actually walked into Australia. There's another theory that the the, the early Australians, the Aboriginal Australians, actually walked into uh, into southern India. And there's a weird theory that says some of the Australians have genetic roots in in northeastern Brazil. Go figure that out. Um, so that is a long walk. So we have been a small species. Um, two to three percent of a- any human you see has Neanderthals. And uh, we actually stole, uh, I'm okay at the time here, I'll probably uh, accelerate it a little bit. Um, so we stole the, the uh, what we're called MHCs or uh, hi- major histocompatibility complexes, the immune system. We stole the immune system from Neanderthals. We killed them off as a species. Uh, there's a whole set of theories on why the Neanderthals died off. But what I'm trying to say here is um, uh, two things. You know, we have kind of been um, a small species that have mixed uh, for a long time. And the, the second part is that um, the world is always a very small place. <laughs> even today, in spite of all our differences. Um, so again, I'll, I'll, you know, as a systems guy, I will tell you that you know, we have 7,500 named parts. Um, some of them are, when this was written, by the way, we did not know that the, the brain has its own lymph system. So lymph is a garbage collector for cells. Uh, we recycle cells and rebuild our AGs, Ts, and Cs, and our proteins. We actually are a very good recycler as well. We did not know, when I studied anatomy, um, uh, I did a year of med school, but you know, when I studied anatomy, they didn't teach us that the human brain had its own lymph system. There was a whole theory about you know, how do drugs move from the blood to the brain. Um, that theory is out of the window because the, now we know that the brain has its own lymph system. So there are new organs being discovered. There's actually a new organ in your, in your gut as well. That uh, We used to have a magnetic uh, compass in our nose that, that went away. So you know, we are constantly learning about ourselves. That's the other thing about data here. Uh, 640 skeletal muscles, uh, muscles, uh, and then uh, 206 bones. You know, newborns have 40 more bones because remember, when you're a newborn, you have the fontanelle and actually joins up into a, into the skull. Uh, 60 plus organs. The most important organ is the skin, uh, which is actually being exposed every day. Allergy is a very, very interesting concept in the very recent past about. You know, if you touch things, if you touch allergens, that's actually more allergenic to you than if you actually imbibe it, if you eat it. So we have 30 to 50 trillion cells. I already mentioned that. We have a lot more, one and a half times more microbiome cells, bacteria, fungi, and viruses. So we have more other creatures in us than us ourselves. So we may be just a shell for creatures that are way older than us. So just take that home. (laughs) Uh, So what is data? So I will kind of tell you a very interesting story about um, uh, a guy who was a rock musician uh, for all the uh, younger folks out there in the audience, this is my OK Boomer slide, if you will. I don't know if many of you will recognize Frank Zappa. He was actually a very creative musician, also a philosopher and some other things. In 1979, he wrote the album, uh, Joe's Garage Act III. Um, and in, the, in, that, in that song, uh, there's a song in there called The Bus. In that song, there's a, a set of lyrics. You know, information is not knowledge. Knowledge is not wisdom. Wisdom is not truth. Truth is not beauty. Beauty is not love. Uh, love is not music. 
music is the best, uh, best you know. I come from a musical family. Uh, my last name, Joshi, is actually um, my father's older brother was Pandit Bhimsen Joshi, the singer. So uh, I come from a musical family. I love music. Uh, but, you know, how do you get from data uh, to information, to knowledge, to wisdom, to love, to music? So how do you make data music? I think that is the journey we'll be going in for the future. Um, and you, data is just these, you know, dots of uh, things. You coalesce them into this um, smaller world of in information, and then you join things together uh, to create some knowledge. You impart that knowledge either uh, verbally or via text or now via streams. And then wisdom is this uh, collective insights that our ancestors have provided us uh, in, in some oral histories as well. Uh, the Vedas are a good example. Uh, I told this to my mother, who used to teach English, by the way. She's the real teacher here. Um, she taught English both in engineering and in, in, um, in pre-university. And she said, no, 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 this was not, this was not Frank Zappa. There was a guy named T.S. Eliot who actually wrote a very interesting poem called The Rock in 1934, which had very similar lyrics. You know, why can't we get from um, information to knowledge? Why can't we get from knowledge to truth? Uh, that was a poem in 1934. So data science technically has been around uh, for a law uh, about 100 years. Um, I would say the first data science law was written in 1730 by a guy named Jacob Bernoulli. Uh, who wrote The Law of Large Numbers. Uh, you could go look that up. Uh, but you, we exist in this form of uh, slow data and fast data. And, um, and fast data is coming at us. Uh, all the YouTube streams that you see, the TikTok streams, um, they're fast data. They have, you know, I don't know how much noise versus information they have, but that's uh, debatable. There are some very good TikTok videos. Um, so uh, slow data is stuff we've collected over time. For example, our knowledge about genetics. Um, that is literally 50 plus years old. Um, uh, from how corn, uh, it's called Jumping Genes in Corn by Barbara McClintock. There's actually a lot of famous women scientists who have been forgotten. I would say we need to resurrect uh, our women scientists. I think um, um, uh, there are quite a few that have been kind of brushed aside. Uh, we need more women. Um, God knows we need more women because there won't be any men left in two million years. Um, so how do you move from fast and slow data to relevant information, relevant data, and actionable data? What, what, there's a lot of dirty data out there. There's a lot of no noisy data out there. How do you clean that up into something that is not biased, that actually moves into this validated space, into this archival knowledge space, and then finally into collective wisdom that we can all share? There should not be information asymmetry. There has to be honesty and, and uh, sharing that happens at some time in the future. So that's my take on data. Um, you know, I'll come back to the virus. So um, uh, the human virome, or uh, so let me do some definitions very quickly. I'll probably finish in about two or three minutes. Um, so the antigen is, are pieces of, uh, uh, within a virus or other pathogens or things that harm human beings. Um, we're always, there's this Star Wars, good versus evil, or Ravana, Rama fight going on at the cellular level every minute, every second of every day. We just don't see it. So antigens are these pieces of chemicals or uh, viruses or, or p uh, components that induce or generate antibodies. Antibodies are, in humans are these five Y-shaped um, uh, molecules, um, if I remember right, A, D, G, E, uh, and M. Um, so um, uh, depending on what, the, what st is sticking on each end of the Y, uh, it forms your, uh, your antibody. Um, so a peptide is actually a chain uh, between two and 50 amino acids. So uh, DNA creates, um, uh, amino acids creates proteins. Uh, so we have 20 amino acids in the human body. Uh, virome is a collection of viruses. So the researchers here actually looked at um, 108, um, 108 is actually a very interesting number in, in Hinduism, but uh, uh, in Canada it's Nura Intu or uh, uh, Exoart or whatever else. Uh, it's a very interesting number. Uh, I'm a numbers guy too. Um, so, um, so antibody peptide reactions um, across more than 500 humans. This is a very, very deep study. So the bottom line is, you know, on the average, every human being uh, has at any given time about 10 different viral species inside you. Um, that we don't know about, that our antibodies are fighting them. Uh, some people have up to 100 species of viruses. How many species are there totally? Um, that's actually a good question. I don't know the answer to that question. There's uh, 
Some people say there is um, uh, about um, uh, 100 million species of viruses on Earth. About 100,000 affect human beings. So we are only seeing, when we say SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19, we're only seeing a few of them that, that are famous. Um, there are hundreds of thousands of species. We don't even know what's going on at this point. So, um, so here, I mean, the bottom line from this chart is, you know, we have known some of these viruses for a long time. Um, we all carry them. So we're, we've been carriers for, for a long, long time. And let's just learn to live with them is what I, I say. Let me come to SARS-CoV-2, my last two slides here. So uh, full circle, RNA, um, uh, lipids, uh, so on. So let's take a thought experiment here. Let's take all the viruses on, on planet Earth, uh, put them end to end, um, take a wild guess how long that chain is. That is an incredibly long chain, actually. It, is, uh, it, it can cross the Milky Way. So just the viruses, if you put them one on top of each other, they can cross the Milky Way 1,000 times. So these are things that are compressed in, in physical space on Earth that are more than humans, way more than humans, bacteria and, and viruses. And um, so the coronavirus uh, that we're seeing today is this very interesting um, thesis that has come by that we're trying to understand. And, um, you know, there's a lot of proteins in here, not too many. It's actually a very small genetic code. It's 30 kilobases compared to 5 billion, 6 billion bases, um, uh, base pairs in the human, 3 billion base pairs, so 6 billion bases in humans. So very small thing, but it can... Uh, do some very interesting things inside the human body. Um, this is my last uh, confuse the heck out of the audience slide. Uh, all I'm trying to say here is we live in a very complex world. There, in the top left, you can see, you know, we're trying to understand the difference between signal and noise. Um, there's political agendas. There's, uh, there's racial agendas. There's all this noise coming around with the virus. And we have these fantastic models that that uh, people talk about, you know, what is the predicted uh, infection rate, things like that. There's a famous uh, statistician, uh, machine learning scientist named George Box, who famously said, uh, all models are wrong. Some are useful. You just have to keep learning and be curious. And science is all about um, uh, under trying to understand things. You can't really prove anything. Mathematics has shown that. Uh, but you can just try to understand things a little better. We live in a complex world. Um, the, uh, the defense secretary of the United States many years ago said, um, you know, we have this known knowns that you can actually put some context around. You have these known unknowns, you know, things we somewhat know but don't understand quite well. We have these unknown knowns, you know, things out there that we know but we don't know how it affects things. And then unknown unknowns. That, the unknown unknown f phrase was a famous uh, Donald Rumsfeld saying, uh, and then he said, oh, we need to have these small teams that go and uh, figure out what's going on in the world. That was his thesis as well. So exploration data, exploratory data and analytics is actually critical when, you, when there's a lot of unknown unknowns. Don't believe any, everything you read. Um, be, be skeptical. Be help, you know, in Buddhism, they say, um, and even Plato's cave, ask the questions that, that inspire you. Uh, build good experiments. Um, you know, I'm not going to go into the immunopathology space. Um, in the testing space, I would say for uh, coronavirus or uh, COVID-19, um, the RNA is all we're doing. So I don't know if you see this little gray peak here. This is all we're doing right now. We need to be doing these kind of tests, what's called seroprevalence test in the community. Um, so we're not there yet. So we're just trying to understand the complexities of quality and testing and, and confusion matrices and, you know, uh, false positives and false negatives and, and sensitivity and specificity. And these are all very complex topics that we need to be very aware of. And any type of data uh, exercise you do, you need to understand what that means. Um, and again, the human body is complex. So you can see this chart, this graph of very, very complicated connections uh, in that graph as to how the SARS-CoV-2 affects what's called the ACE2 inhibitor pathway. And then that pathway actually is connected to many other things in the hormonal space, in the enzyme space, in, in the organ space. In fact, a lot of uh, cardiologists tell me that um, 
that SARS-CoV-2 is not really a, a lung a virus, but it's actually a blood system virus. It's a, it's a cardiovascular thing, which is why we may see some interesting effects later on. But that all uh, aside, you know, we're getting into this new world where we have to, hygiene becomes important. You know, our ancestors told us to, you know, wash our hands, wash our feet when we come in. There was a reason why. There was a reason why we did fermented foods. Uh, we've kind of forgotten that. There was a reason why we did a lot of things scientifically. So we have to get into that space again. You know, how do you build these virtual trials that are you know, remote, uh, that we understand what, how humans are behaving in their hyper-local environments? You know, every, everybody's uh, important. All diseases are rare. And um, so with that kind of complexity and context, let me stop. I've gone five minutes above, but I'll take any questions, uh, tomatoes or eggs or, <laughs> or or whatever else. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sanjay. This was amazing. Thank you very much. This was something which was, was truly like, like a lot of times we are not able to actually understand these complex things. And, and as they rightly said, theology is way more complex than physics. And, and I think I, I think this was lovely. And, and to sum it up, I think in a couple of very interesting pointers that I, I, even I believe life came from space. RNA is the precursor of everything. And, and this was very interesting. I never knew that we have 1.5 times the number of, of cells that we have uh, uh, in our human body are, are actually external uh, micro, uh, my, microbes. So this is very, very interesting. Thank you very much for this. So we have a couple of questions starting with, yes. uh, so, so relating it more towards education because we believe that you, you've, yes, seen, absolutely. The entire, you've seen the entire pedigree of, of, of healthcare education, you've, 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 you've tried ed, uh, medicine, you've, you've done, um, info, you've, you've done um, a lot of things in, in terms of uh, microbiology, in terms of, of, of biology, molecular sciences. So, so the first question that a lot of our students have is what can educational institutes do differently to bridge the gap between engineering disciplines, biology and healthcare? Uh, because yeah, uh, currently they tend to be taught very separately. So w what are your views on that? Um, so I actually sit on a couple of um, panels looking at what, how medical education is going to be for the future. You're a doctor by training. Um, doctors are not taught data science. Um, statistics is just one piece. And now you're understanding, you're getting into this whole world of uh, genomics, which is very probabilistic. You may have 1.5% probability of getting Alzheimer's disease. Uh, you may have 30% um, a chance of getting, the, what does that mean in, in context? I think, uh, um, uh, I, I would say early on, um, uh, a more practical, and this whole um, COVID-19 has taught us that, you know, education does not have to be about um, uh, pedagogic, um, you know, the, the teacher rattling something and then going away and then you doing something asynchronously. Um, I think there needs to be um, participatory um, education from professionals like me, for example, in industry, um, and then scientists within the industry itself who come and impart more practical things. Uh, people always told me, hey, mathematics is useless. Uh, I, I never use differential equations. Uh, everything I talked about, how, you know, how meteors flow through space, that's all differential equations. Uh, so, you know, the importance of things are very important. Um, I would say equality in education. Uh, uh, you know, um, uh, we say pundits, actually. People who have the privilege of being educated uh, do well in life, and that's a that's you know because they ask, they're curious, they ask questions. If you push a society to um, not have the opportunity, I would say that's uh, one of the worst things we can do for humanity for the future. So, um, two practical things. Uh, I would say education does not have to be pedagogic. Uh, it, ha it 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 can be participatory. Uh, some of the most interesting questions I've had are from people who are in the process of learning. My mother used to tell me all, uh, all your degrees giving you is um, two things. It is teaching you how to learn. And the second thing is teaching you how to be a better citizen. Yeah. That's it. Um, you have to continuously learn. I have uh, kept that theory in my life that you have to continuously learn. You should never stop learning. Uh, I have never stopped learning. I'm a hacker, by the way, as well. I was telling you before we started the meeting that I'm a white hat hacker as well. So I do security stuff. And I learn a lot of things that way. So I think learning should never stop. And learning should not be degree-based either, I would say. 
Um, I know Google has taken a very interesting approach to learning now that they're actually going to be creating Amazon as well. Um, my company, Dell, has some very interesting education pieces that you can come into our companies and actually learn. And so I think this conference of degrees and conference of um, uh, uh, stratifying degrees, I would say, has to change. And um, I hope that this whole COVID-19 changes the way we look at education. We hope the same. I, I think this is a very valid point. And and uh, so coming on to the next, I, I think uh, personally, I, I've, I've read a lot about you and I was extremely fascinated and would love to know your journey. How did you, was it an accident that, that you actually did instrumentational technology from oh. home? So would love to yeah. know that why you. are or where, where, where you are today. So I was privileged to have um, some of the, uh, most curious minds. So my, my uncle, my father's older brother, Pandit Bhimsen Joshi, ran away from Gadag uh, to Lucknow, uh, become part of the Kirana Gharana. Uh, so he did whatever he wanted to do. He had what? He told me he had four rupees in his pocket or whatever then uh, in the early uh, 40s or 50s. And um, there was the Guru Shishya uh, process, uh, even in music, which is important. Uh, but I think along the process, um, that those nuggets of information. So I learned these nuggets of information from some very famous people in my family. I've had the privilege of having uh, some very forward-looking people. So my mother's younger brother was uh, Dr. N. Sheshigiri. Dr. Sheshigiri actually was uh, f with the Planning Commission with the Government of India. He was Special Secretary to uh, Rajiv Gandhi yeah. when he was Prime Minister. Um, so um, he was one of the youngest PhDs from TIFR. Uh, so I had the privilege of talking to uh, Raju, who was my uncle, not know he's no more. But um, and I asked him, you know, wh what was important? And he told me this. And this was a long time ago. He said hardware is actually more important than software. And he he, he used to study the he used to study water, by the way, for his PhD yeah. thesis in physics. And I, yeah. that's why I mentioned that water is a very strange molecule. It's very important. But he, he and I sat down and talked about. Uh, uh, a few things. Uh, why is hardware more important than software? If you're a machine, if you're interested in machine learning and data science, I would actually, I would actually steer you more into hardware. I'll tell you the same thing my uncle told me, yeah. that uh, software is ubiquitous and um, it is very fuzzy. Uh, hardware, you have to do things in quality that you have to make things better, which is why we're technically a hardware, um, we're a hardware software interface machine, yeah. but our software is ourselves and the DNA. <laughs> Very interesting. I would just request you, Sanjay, to just uh, stop your screen share so, so that we Oh, yes. Yeah. No worries. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and I'll see the comments as well. Great. So another... Yeah, oh, by the way, oh, quite a few questions. Sorry. <laughs> so a very interesting question that a lot of people want to know is... Uh, do you want to moderate or do you want me to just go through it? I, I'll just ask you one more question. This is this is also because I, I, I love this question and, and I'm I'm extremely inquisitive about, about synthetic biology and I, I know you 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 you've shared a lot of thoughts oh, about yeah. it early on. So do you think there is any any harm to knowing so much about your genome that tomorrow it can be actually misused by someone? The all the all the fancy words of chromosome uh, manufacturing and all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I actually know uh, uh, Jeff Boca at NYU Langone, and yeah. then um, there's a couple of folks in China, a couple in uh, Edinburgh, Scotland, who are actually creating um, uh, the next um, uh, 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 3D manufacturing engine for chromosomes. Uh, yeah. So th it's the same thesis either for data science, or will robots become smarter than humans? That's the first part of the question. The second part of the question is, um, will we destroy ourselves because we know who we are um, at the very lowest level? And um, the simple answer I would give is uh, we've almost destroyed ourselves as humans a thousand times. So we've had close to a thousand extinction events for humans um, over, over life. Uh, we'll come out of it okay. So I'm, uh, I'm an optimist. So I would say that uh, you know, we'll figure out a way how to uh, put some curbs and barriers and, and so on. <laughs> Yeah, very interesting. So we have a lot of questions. Um, uh, I'll yeah. Be, uh, did you want to just see the questions and answer? I, I could. I could pick uh, the ones I think are interesting, or if someone wants to moderate, uh, I'm fine with that too. Uh, do you uh -huh. want to take a first uh, crack okay. in moderation? Uh, no. Yeah, okay. Good. <laughs> yeah. No worries. Uh, thanks, Sanjay. We'll take up some of the questions from the audience. Um, so starting off with one more on like products, which are like product management, the so next big thing. So in the health tech space. 
What are your thoughts on remote monitoring? Uh, that is building oh. wearable products to detect vital function. Yeah. What's the scope of this product and what's the best way to approach this idea? Uh, thank you. So my first telemedicine project, uh, I used to work at Seattle Children's Hospital uh, many, many years ago. I used to be in radiology research. Um, so my first telemedicine project was in 1994. And the story I tell people is um, it is not about the technology in the end. So the technology was there. So fiber optics were there and as, uh, actually since the late 70s. Uh, fiber optic switching was there since the early 80s. Um, telemedicine has been there literally. Um, well, doctors used to take their bag and actually visit. The human used to go to the last mile or the last foot uh, to the patient. So remote monitoring, um, uh, uh, and that world is changing, and that's why I'm telling this story. So technology has always been there. Um, it is the the legal system and the the payment system. So you know, most democracies and non-democracies as well exist uh, for a couple of things. You know, you have to have a, a some monetary compensation, some compensation of some sort to the physician and the allied health uh, professions, uh, nurses and, and um, health workers, emergency room physicians and emergency room uh, technicians and so forth. Um, so the legal system has to change. I think um, uh, Pradhan Mantriji actually um, uh, announced this two weeks ago in India especially, um, the universal ID identification system, not Aadhaar, but um, for medical records, uh, that is an essential piece for telemedicine. I, I would say this because, I, because I've been trying to study universal patient IDs for 20, 20 plus years. Um, uh, so that's critical. This, the third part that's critical is um, licensure. And um, are you a real physician coming across or are you, uh, you know, you, you guys, some of you guys are on Facebook and you can see that, you know, the, 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 the possibility of making mischief is very, very real. So fraud and abuse are very, very real in a remote world. So uh, leaving aside the technology, these are critical pieces. So I could tell you a hundred different pieces of technology that are important in a, from a remote perspective. And I would say health, actually, we don't understand what healthy means. When I studied genetics, we said, you know, you're all wild types. Uh, your grandmother was right. You're all special. We're all separate. You know, everything is a rare disease because we have to understand ourselves at the very lowest level individually. And we have to understand ourselves at the hyper local environment because what you eat and what you drink, you know, what you air you breathe is actually as important to health as your, your um, germline mutation or who your parents were. You don't choose your parents. So that 17% of health is you can't help it. You can't help the other 80 plus percent by having a good diet, by exercising, stuff like that. So remote monitoring is absolutely critical for the future. I would say that is the future of medicine and the future of healthcare, both in terms of information systems and in terms of bioengineering and in terms of genetics. Great. Um, thank you for that. I think it's really fascinating. So we have next questions from Tarmish Prasad, and it's kind of breaking back on what you said earlier. Um, just how do you see the evolution say in like thousand, hundred thousand years, keeping genetic engineering in mind? This is a very, very interesting question. So I had this theory many years ago. Uh, you remember T-Rexes? They had very, very big heads, very small arms. Um, a lot of you play games. I'm, I'm sure there are 80% of the audience here are gamers. Um, so our visual cortex is getting bigger, by the way. Um, and um, you could see that um, in India, um, there are, what, 20 or 30 companies that buy, bring you food? So uh, food is a commodity. So uh, if you say, you know, I don't have to hunt anymore, I don't have to run outside and exercise all my limbs. And um, so uh, one theory is we'll become these bigger and bigger, bigger brains and smaller and smaller and smaller limbs. We'll be sitting in one place. We'll be tied to each other like the matrix. Of course, that's a very dystopian view. I hope we don't become that. But, uh, but uh, there's another theory that, you know, we will engineer ourselves uh, to be um, kind of um, two or three different um, um, species together. And uh, there's a famous sex researcher out of uh, La Trobe University in, in Australia. Um, um, her first name is Jenny, I forget her last name. But um, she's the one who proposed this theory that the male chromosome is shrinking and therefore you won't have any men left in two million years. Nothing to do with genetic engineering, but just the way evolution is happening. What happens after that? Are men going to become this, uh, uh, 
human shrew uh, species that are only used for uh, uh, work, uh, drones for women? Uh, I don't know the answer to these questions, but these are all very interesting experiments that can be done. If you take a purely synthesized creature, there was a, another very, very um, uh, big debate about whether the virus was engineered. Uh, I don't know if how many have looked at that, but you know, was it a, a military exercise? Uh, actually, it's not. I could tell you that with some certainty, having talked to quite a few people. But we're kind of entering this very fuzzy space uh, where um, we don't know what's real anymore. You know, you, you can actually create fakes on videos and this may be uh, actually all virtual. Who knows? I may be a virtual human being. <laughs> uh, there's a theory in physics as well that we may be living in 11 dimensional space and um, basically um, um, uh, we're actually projected on a multidimensional um, uh, hologram that we live in these uh, very, very fascinating lives, 11 parallel lives we don't know that are quantum compressed. And so I can go on, but you know, we don't understand. Uh, I would say, as an optimist, I would say, you know, let's not worry about what we don't understand yet. Let's ask questions maybe to get better at understanding it. <laughs> so I think um, we can't really predict the future, can we? So I think I'll just also like giving a bit of context. We have a lot of college students as well as, um, you know, yeah. high school students. And a few questions have come on the careers, especially when you talk about biology yeah. and data. So I think one of the questions around, like, as a data scientist, what are the career pathways one can get uh, into in the healthcare space? as well as like at the intersection of it, what would be the next best ideas? So yeah, that's a great question. But I'll, before that, I'll answer some books to read. Um, and by the way, I'll send you a list so you could actually distribute it as well. But the book that was asked was, uh, it's called The Disappearing Spoon. Um, the name of the book is called The Disappearing Spoon. It's actually a fascinating book on chemistry. So uh, I would say not much, if you had very good teachers, I'm sure they taught you some of that stuff as to why all planets have iron and nickel as, as the core. Um, but that's a fascinating book. It's written by a PhD uh, physics guy who was a New York Times science columnist. So very, very smart guy. But um, uh, to answer your question on, on uh, career paths, you know, I, I would say, you know, that very simply understand the fundamentals, ask questions about the fundamentals and be curious. Um, yeah, pa career pathways are important. Um, most of mine have taken very accidental turns. Um, mentors are important. Uh, go ask stupid questions. There are no stupid questions. Go ask questions to anybody you want to. Be constructively skeptical about everything in life. Um, I know it's a random, uh, broad answer, but uh, for specifically in 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 biology and uh, I would say understand mathematics a little better. <laughs> I would say applied mathematics because the future is uh, understanding very complex um, um, uh, uh, ecosystems of data and how do you clean data? You need to understand some of the domain itself. Um, there's a, two theories that number one, you don't need to ask, you know, understand the domains, you need to ask a good question. Therefore you understand domains. Einstein said, you know, um, only talk about stuff you understand a little bit, you know, otherwise ask questions. I know Plato said that, I know a lot of Hindu philosophy asks that too. But um, so, yeah, I think it's, um, um, you know, there's no bad uh, uh, career path in my opinion. Yes, um, how much money do you need? Yes, that brought, gets brought up a lot. You don't need much money to be happy. Uh, I would say curiosity, for me at least, is what makes me happy. Great. I think, um, I know we'll be running out of time soon. There's one. Yeah, five minutes more. Yeah. yeah. So the two questions actually would, uh, like you specifically mentioned that you want the crazy questions. So one of them is drawn <laughs> like, uh, more, <laughs> so yeah, your thoughts on the book Sapiens. I think I've been a very fascinating, oh, wow. okay. it's a fascinating yeah. read. And the second yeah. one is more open-ended and it's from Maple Singh, who's actually a student at Plaksha University. Um, so why is so much importance given to water in the search of alternate life? Why is the possibility of life to exist in a totally different paradigm than our origin based on different uh, chemistry and bio not considered off? Yeah, this is a great, so, um, sorry, what was the first one again? Your thoughts on- Before sapiens. the water? Your thoughts sapiens. on- Okay, yes. Uh, both the book and, and the series. So there's two. Uh, and again, I'll send you a whole list on um, 
uh, books. Uh, there's, um, there's two other books that I would actually recommend people to read. Uh, one is called The Violinist Thumb, um, the, the Thumb of the Violinist. Um, uh, it's the same guy that wrote, uh, wrote The Disappearing Spoon. Uh, and um, by the way, I have disjointed uh, fingers. Uh, it's actually a very interesting gene called fibrillin and fibulin. Um, so this guy used to do frets and violins that nobody else could reach. And he had a very, very strong thumb, even though it bent in a very odd way. Uh, as a doctor, you probably know that uh, you can get, ask questions about Marfan syndrome and some other things, but we won't go there. So um, it's, it's, it's about connective tissue in the end. So it's a very great book. And that starts with why, why Paganini, which was, who was a famous Italian violinist, uh, had this condition and how he could play the violin so well. Um, uh, the second question about water, uh, so that's one book. The other book is called The Neanderthal Man, written by a fantastic geneticist. Uh, his name is Swante Pabo. Uh, Swante is uh, at the University of uh, Leipzig in Germany. And so he talks about Neanderthals and how we move from Neanderthals to humans. Uh, there's many books available. Um, the, the Woman with the Worm in Her Head. Uh, there's some fantastic uh, diagnosing giants. Uh, they actually diagnosed how famous people politicians, uh, kings, uh, presidents, they, w what conditions they died of. It's actually, if you're interested in medicine, that's a fascinating book as well. Uh, the question about water is a fantastic question. So why can't creatures live in sulfurous or methane environments? I don't have an answer to that question, honestly. Uh, what we understand from human biology, we understand because we've studied human biology. There may be other combinations of... Um, um, uh, of chemicals on other planets. Um, I'm sure you've seen Star Trek, uh, the, the series, and you know, it was basically a human story. There's only 26 plots to any, 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 any story. Um, if you're a data scientist, uh, there's actually a fascinating sidebar here. Mm -hmm. It's called Politi, P-O-L-I-T-I. Politi is uh, 26 dramatic plots. So they actually has built an ontology on all the stories possible in, in human lore. Um, if you take that thesis to life, I would say there are endless possibilities. And you just have to create environments in, in, in space and time and, and high pressure and zero pressure or minus 273 degrees centigrade. You just have to create experiments to see what works and what not. This whole tar water and portability was an experiment that they conducted actually that they figured out that um, they could actually create. Um, um, there's actually 64 amino, 63 amino acids you can create theoretically, but humans have only 20 because the others, you can't, they don't survive in, in the conditions we have. Great. Thank you so much, Sanjay, for all the fantastic answers. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to express my gratitude on behalf of Laksha University. Thank you so much again for like, taking out time today from your busy you. schedule and addressing us. It's truly a pleasure uh, to have you amongst us and from your learn from your fascinating experiences and really know about the future of health tech, right? And um, Thank you. just yeah. before we yeah. end the session, I would love for you to share some closing remarks with us. Yeah, so a uh, couple of things. Um, uh, I'm, I'll send the, um, uh, the changed, I sent you a PDF version so you could distribute it to whoever wants it. Uh, I have two goals in life. Um, uh, one is to share knowledge and one is to uh, have some social redemption uh, that I did something that was useful to society. Um, so I think we should all have uh, some of those goals. Money is not everything in life. Uh, I would say um, be curious, um, uh, ask questions, uh, ask questions constructively. Don't, uh, don't be a, what do they say, COVID yet nowadays? Or, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but, but ask questions and uh, people are, you know, if you ask it nicely, people uh, will talk to you. Be, you know, that's how you get mentors as well. You know, uh, be fearless and uh, don't be nervous. And uh, you, you will learn a lot. <laughs> Thank, you. Was, Thank you very much, Sanjay. It was such an amazing session. And, and, and next year we are launching uh, our, our first maiden batch of Flaksha University uh, in Mohali. So we would look forward to hosting you there and, and also <laughs> guiding our students um, uh, next year onwards. Thank you very much. One final that. thing. Yeah, yeah. This, is, this too shall end. So uh, yeah. we, I, I've talked to some famous scientists around the world. We're actually finding some vaccines. It's not going to come in December. It may come sometime next year, but we will. And India, by the way, uh, Serum Institute Pune and uh, Vaccine Institute uh, as well, 
uh, uh, I don't know if you know that uh, more than 60% of vaccines in the world come from India. Yeah. So uh, if, if you have to understand viruses, there's no better place. Of course, there's uh, mycobacteria like TB, which are still problems. But um, yeah, so um, India is actually the central place to understand vaccines. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you. Um, that was absolutely lovely Bye, and inspiring. Um, just one more, like just one couple of minutes more. Sure, um, sure. Thank absolutely. you, Sandra. Yeah, okay. For delivering this engaging, insightful talk. I think we can speak for the audience that you all are a lot more aware. Yeah. I would also like to thank Ritesh um, for being a wonderful yeah. host as always. Your stories and experience have always been fascinating for us. And we are lucky to have you on our journey to create Plaksha University. And a big thank you to the audience for tuning into Tech Talks today. We apologize for not being able to take up all the questions. We do appreciate your engagement throughout the webinar and through the whole series. Um, a shout out to all the teachers out there on, on Teacher's Day. So a big yeah. happy Teacher's Day to you. What you do on a yeah. daily basis is truly inspiring and you're changing lives. More power to you. Um, so we'll be hosting a lot of exciting events up, um, and talks in the coming months. Stay tuned for more details. Have a lovely evening. Stay healthy and stay safe. Thank you. My mother and two sisters are teachers. So happy Teacher's Day. <laughs> happy Teacher's Day. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>